for uh, putting together this really nice workshop and for getting us all to this beautiful place here. Um, I'm going to present a new analysis of uh, previously published data. And yesterday, we, uh, there was quite a bit of talk about choice probability. And uh, when I refer to the choice probability, I also refer to, uh, what I mean by that, I refer to the responses, the correlation between the responses uh, or the trial to trial, um, um, I'm referring to the res uh, correlation between the responses of sensory neurons and behavioral judgment uh, during a perceptual decision task. And what I um, or what suggested in previous work with Bruce is um, that in these search probabilities, a component, um, or it's most parsimonious to conclude that a component actually reflects um, top-down signals. And that's um, schematically shown here by this uh, arrow going from the behavioral judgment to the uh, response of sensory neurons. And when I think about these top-down signals, I broadly kind of have, yeah, yeah say, say two broad classes of these uh, top-down signals. I think that um, it could, um, that could do uh, cause these correlations. And one is uh, what I refer to as an expectation or bias. So from trial to trial, the uh, animal um, changes their expectation about the next upcoming stimulus. And this expectation influences the responses of the sensory neurons and thereby introduces a bias and causes these correlations. Or alternative, and that's, I think, uh, mostly the um, top-down signal that Bruce was referring to yesterday. But the, uh, a second, also broad class of uh, top-down signals um, is something what I would refer, refer to as post-decision feedback. And that is, the decision is actually made in a feed-forward causal way, uh, but then there's a signal reflecting this decision being sent back onto the sensory neurons um, and after the decision ha um, has already been formed. And that is, uh, is the po uh, top-down signal that Klaus was referring to yesterday in his talk. And what has been somewhat frustrating to me is when um, talking about these top-down signals that people often ask, yeah, what kind of top-down signals do you think it is? And I don't think we actually had a good way of differentiating it between these broad, um, yeah, broad classes. And I'm quite excited because this new analysis, I think, allows us to get a handle uh, at this question of differentiating these two uh, classes. And uh, I'm going to take advantage of a psychophysical observation that has been made in humans, monkeys, and, um, and mice, and I think also rats. And that is that the response or the choice on the contra is actually influenced by uh, how the <coughs> subject responded on previous trials. And um, the first question I'm going to ask here now is whether this response has history also affects the responses of sensory neurons. And to my knowledge, that hasn't real, uh, really been shown yet. And um, if that is the case, and I should say it is, um, and so if that is uh, so, does the influence of uh, the, uh, the response history on behavior, does it, uh, is it mediated by the responses of the sensory neurons? And the second question is, in a way, I think, uh, reformulating this expectation bias scheme. So one way to f formulate it is to say, so does response history kind of generate some kind of expectation about what's going to happen on the next trial? And if this expectation then influences the responses of neurons and uh, thereby influences the actual behavioral response. So is this how um, this choice history um, uh, influences behavior on the current trial. And um, yeah, and I think with this analysis, we're actually um, then hopefully going to be able to uh, start to differentiate these two um, broad top-down schemes. So the behavioral task is actually a depth of disparity discrimination task uh, where we trained the monkeys to um, discriminate whether the central disk in a random dot pattern is protruding relative to the surrounding areas, and then it would be called a near stimulus, or whether it's receding uh, relative to the surrounding annulus. 
And um, so I'm schematically showing this here in 2D and using uh, shading to give you the impression of depth. And the monkeys actually saw it in 3D. And um, then we use temporal noise to make the stimulus harder. And it might not work. Anyway, so yeah, so, so we just kind of uh, introduce, that's just, again, a schematic view of what the stimulus actually looked like. And um, then we titrated the, the noise to, to or, or varied the noise to make the stimulus harder. Okay, and um, th yeah, then I recorded the activity of a single units in area V2 from the sparsely selected neurons while the monkeys were performing this task. And uh, they, uh, as soon as they started fixating, the stimulus would come up, be presented for a fixed duration of two seconds at the end. Um, and if they made a choice towards the correct uh, choice target, they would receive a liquid reward. Okay, so now I have this data set and I'm going to analyze it um, um, by using uh, a GLM model where I'm putting into the model the stimulus on the current trial, the stimulus on the previous trial, and then also the, um, the correct, um, whether the stimulus on the previous trial was correct and what the choice on the previous trial was. And that's a kind of a way of trying to get at the monkey's yeah, behavioral strategy to look at whether history influenced it uh, that was developed by uh, Jakob Macke and his colleagues with whom I'm collaborating uh, on this uh, analysis. And um, by breaking uh, um, the history into these two components, we actually, uh, that's a way of how we can um, then examine the monkey's behavioral strategy. And um, so for each of these components, we get a weight uh, to check how, um, to see how much they influence then the, the behavioral choice. And what I'm doing now, I'm just plotting the weight for the previous choice on the x-axis here against the weight of the previously correct stimulus on the y-axis. And, um, by, and um, in, in this way, I can actually um, differentiate what the monkey's behavioral strategy was, whether they, for instance, tended to win, uh, stay, and then lose switch, or whether um, on the right-hand side of the plot is kind of here, this would be the corner of, um, of the stubborn, so they stick to the same strategy, uh, whether it's working or not, and what might spring to mind, it's uh, Merkel's austerity strategy for Southern Europe. And, but the monkeys actually had exactly the opposite uh, strategy, they tended to switch. And they mostly tended to switch uh, regardless um, oh, they had a slight tendency to switch more when the previous trial uh, was a loss, but mostly uh, larger tended to switch. And initially I was quite puzzled by this uh, because this was such a consistent st a strategy, but then at some point I actually looked at the stimulus sequence and it turned out that the stimulus sequence wasn't entirely random, but because we used a pseudo-random uh, uh, randomization, there um, there was a slight increase of uh, consecutive, consecutive, consecutive trials to switch the sign. So it seems that the monkey actually picked up on this uh, statistic in the, in the stimulus sequence and thereby um, developed this strategy. But here I'm, um, but the advantage of using, doing this uh, analysis with the GLR model, this is not confounded by the, um, the stimulus sequence when I look at these, these weights in individually because I've put in the, two uh, the current and the previous stimulus as well as separate components. Okay, so uh, this suggests to us that yes, the monkeys um, were influenced by their previous choices and then we can now, uh, now we can look at how strong that influence was actually on the current choice. So, um, so how well it actually predicts choices on the current trial. And by this, I'm going to extend the GLM. And what I'm going to include as well is um, what, I, what is, is the available reward size on the current and on the previous trial. And we had actually used two reward sizes. So on, 
the, the monkeys would always start getting a small reward size, and if they got three consecutive trials correctly, the uh, reward size would be uh, switched to a large reward size, and they would get on all consecutive correct trials, they would receive a large reward until the next error, when it would then be switched uh, down again to a small reward size. And that was basically just used to keep the monkey's motivation up. And, um, but, and we had, um, I had looked at how it affects behavior, and they have a, a lower psychophysical threshold than the available reward size is large. So they actually learned this, um, this, um, these re reward contingencies. And then I'm also putting into this model the spike count on the current trial. And it's essentially the same, uh, just another way of computing choice probability, if I put it in here. And, um, okay, and then I can look at how these different components, how well they actually um, predict choice. And, yeah, and the way I'm um, evaluating it, uh, this model is I'm fitting the model on all trials that, um, that contains a stimulus signal, and then I'm predicting the choices and all, uh, on all trials that contained a 0% signal. And I should say, um, so we didn't use frozen noise, but we had a way in this uh, analysis to actually correct for the stimulus, to co correct the current uh, spike counts for a stimulus-induced uh, component. And the spike counts that I'm using here, these are corrected uh, spike counts. And um, so if I, yeah, and then I simply, um, get a prediction from the model of the current choice, and then look at uh, how well it matches the actual choice that we measured. And from that, I compute what I uh, say in quote, the choice probability. So it's not based on ROC analysis here. Okay, and uh, the choice probability I get is 0.57, which is, which is exactly, simply based on the spike count, which is exactly the value that I had also found using ROC analysis, and then when I correlated with those values from the RRC analysis, the correlation is, yeah, is just scattered around the identity line. So that was just a sanity check uh, that this model works and gives the same result, that, and so that was nice. And then I look at how choice and reward history influences the choices, and what I find is uh, the choice probability or, uh, uh, based on that is about 0.58. When I uh, only used the stimulus on the previous trial, the choice probability is point um, five three, and um, and um, when I use the full model, it's point uh, six two. Okay, and what I'm mostly going to focus on is not uh, is this component. So yes, we do see that uh, choice and reward history does predict choices, and it does so similarly well as the spike counts on the current trial. And now we can look. Uh, now we've established this behavioral effect, and we can. Uh, do essentially the same analysis but predicting spikes on the current trial and look at whether history also affects spikes. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm having um, again, a different VLM put, in which I'm putting in the uh, stimulus on the current and the previous trial, um, choice and reward history, the current choice. And so this is now computing essentially choice probability but the other way around. You know, uh, and then also the spike count on the previous trial because um, I'm expecting, yeah, that there are the sensory adaptation effects. So I would expect the previous spike count to actually have some effect also on the current spike count. I should say I had put that into also the, the behavioral model, but it, it really didn't do anything. And um, yeah, so that's why I, yeah, I, I already have it here. Okay, and um, then I'm essentially doing the same thing, that I, uh, I'm fitting the model on all uh, trials that contain stimulus signal, and then I'm predicting the, uh, then I'm predicting the spike counts on the 0% signal trials. And what I'm, the way I'm quantifying this now is I, I get a prediction for every trial, and then I com simply compute the correlation between the predicted spike count based on the particular model and the actually measured spike count. 
And then what I'm plotting here is just the distribution of the correlation coefficients for the different cells. And the <coughs> mean uh, correlation coefficient here for, when I just use the spike count on the previous file, is 0.23. Um, yeah. When I use the current choice, it's point, uh, uh, 0.13. When I use the reward history, uh, choice and reward history, then I um, find correlation coefficient of 0.1. And if I use the, and all of these are uh, significantly different uh, from zero, but if I use the previous stimulus, the correlation coefficient on average is 0.02, and that's not significantly different. For the full model, the correlation, uh, mean correlation coefficient is about, uh, yeah, about 0.4. Either that or adaptation, simply like sensory adaptation. You know, you have a very strong stimulus, the, the, the response might adapt. So this, yeah. Oh, okay. this kind of sensory adaptation of neurons, yeah. Negative, yeah. So which we would expect as, yeah, from adaptation. Okay. Um, yeah, what we find yet, yes, again, uh, choice and reward history predicts the spike counts almost as well as uh, the current choice predicts uh, the spike count. Okay, so that, uh, that's nice. And now what I've shown you is that both, uh, that reward history actually affects both the current choice uh, and the spike count on the current trial. Now you can ask, does the choice and reward history affect the current choice via the spike count. And so I'm just reshuffling them. And the way I'm going to test this is by separating the spike count into two components. I'm separating it, it, it into one component that's predicted by the choice and reward history. And then, I'm, uh, and then I have the residual. And then I can compute the choice probability for each of these two components. Okay, and um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. And what I find is, so this is again the choice probability for the full count. And here I'm actually, uh, what I got, so I, I got the predicted, spy, uh, I got the, dis the distributions of spike counts, and then I actually now use uh, ROCN analysis for, and using my real choices to compute the choice probability. And um, Okay, so yeah, for the full spark count, I found again uh, the choice probability of 0.57. Um, and then when I do the choice, uh, compute the choice probability based on the predictions of the spike counts from the previous, uh, from the choice and reward history, the choice probability is very small, uh, 0.52. And it's just barely significant. It's actually not significant in either monkey individually only, but if I collapse it uh, across both. So most of the choice probability of the count spike counts is actually contained in the residual. And that suggests that there's actually seems to be kind of, it, it's, the choice history does most, doesn't really seem to do much to, um, yeah, doesn't really, there's little support uh, uh, for the notion that choice uh, history choice and reward history affects the current uh, choice via the spike count, um, <coughs> via the uh, spike count that's predicted uh, by choice and reward history. And, um, and so I think it kind of uh, put, uh, challenges this notion that, um, that yeah, the uh, reward history now uh, generates some expectation that influences the spike count in the current trial, and this is how um, how the uh, uh, decision is being influenced. Um, now we can actually ask, in a way, uh, kind of switch the two last boxes and ask the, the, the reverse question um, whether the choice and reward history influences the spike count via the current choice. But unfortunately, I can't break down the current choice into two components, so I can't do the, the analogous an, um, analysis that I did before. But what I can do is I can compare 
two models, so I have five more minutes. Yeah, track a little slow. That's okay. Um, so I can break, um, compare two models, and I compare one <coughs> model where I only have uh, the current choice and predict the spike count, or I have a second model where I use the current choice and choice and reward history to uh, predict the current spike count. And if the second model does better, that suggests that, uh, that choice and reward history has additional information about the spike count that's not already contained in the current choice. But if choice and reward history influences the current spike count via the current choice, then these two models not essentially should do the same way. Because all the information from choice and reward history is already contained in the current choice. Okay? And uh, when I do this, um, I compare these two models, oops, then I find that, it, uh, again, predicting the spike count on the current trial, then I find that the correlation coefficients are essentially identical uh, for the two models. Um, I should say, yeah, I should say to be fair, I also included, on, uh, in this model, I also included the, uh, the, the available reward size on the current trial um, to, to be, yeah, while ignoring all the reward history. Um, but if I also take out the entirety in the rewards history and only co compare current choice and uh, just um, choice history, then the two also give me um, essentially the same results. So um, this, these two models um, seem to perform yeah, essentially um, equally well, suggesting that all the information from choice and reward history is already contained in the current choice and suggesting that actually how uh, choice and reward history affects the spike count on the current choice is via the current choice. So I think this provides for, uh, support for this kind of post-decision feedback scheme. And I must say, initially I was um, rather disappointed by this result because in my mind this expectation bias uh, or this that a top-down signal was, would generate some expectation bias that um, influences uh, the neurons um, and, yeah, and thereby then the judgment made in a way much more sense because that I was think, starting to think about this could be a way of how, for instance, a prior might be implemented, or a prior that changes on a very short time scale from trial to trial might be implemented via the uh, responses of sensory neurons. But, um, yeah, it didn't seem to be that there was, I think this analysis suggests that there's not so much support for this, um, for this, um, yeah, for this scheme. And, um, but when I told Ralph about this, he was actually very excited because uh, he thought it fits really well with his sampling theory, and he is going to tell us um, about this um, in his talk later. So I guess it all makes sense. And with this, I would like to summarize. Um, so choice and reward history affects the responses uh, of sensory neurons. It also affects uh, the, uh, it also affects the choice, but not <coughs> via the effect on the sensory uh, neurons. And finally, uh, the effect of choice and reward history on the responses of the sensory neurons seems to be largely uh, post, um, and you know, by post decision uh, feedback. And with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, first Jakob Macke, with whom uh, I did this analysis, and this was, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And also Bruce Cumming, in whose lab I collected all the data, um, and that was also a lot of fun over the years. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Yes, always, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you look at the spike count that just previous to the presentation of the stimulus, so like uh, in no, the Yeah, no, not in this. Uh, no, I didn't look. Okay, so, so I remember in the, in the nature paper, you 
Yeah, I think that one problem is that um, the responses, but in the absence of the stimulus, the responses are very, very, very small and it's hard to do. When I put it in, uh, put it into the behavioral model or took it out, it actually didn't make any difference. That's weird, right? Because it really depends on the nerve work and functioning behavior that has two effects. Should have an effect of, uh, I mean, it's interesting. So is, is, is it adaptive in the sense that it suppresses the response on trial N the, based on the response on trial N minus 1 or the normal? Yes. So it suppresses. could still have it, I mean, the history dependence could di directly influence the behavior, right? Yeah, in the model, there's no history dependence, I agree. In this model, the history somehow first seems to affect the behavior, but it doesn't seem to go via the spikes of the, uh, via the spike count. But this effect on the behavior then influences the spike count. I think that, or that the largest, I should probably be a bit more cautious, the largest component seems to go that route. And it doesn't seem to go that route that this Five counts, and there are there are effects to be made. Yes. So just the fact that the, the trial history influences the influences the behavior, but not by the spike count or the V2 neuron. Is that maybe consistent with the kind of effects that the Laura reported in the previous talk that maybe the effects of trial history are more on kind of strategy and decision policy rather than on the sensory signal? I think yeah. I think exactly. Yeah, so generally they had roughly the same um, 
it's that, that similar behavior. I think one monkey was more strongly influenced um, by the history. I actually, so generally, I think most of the things were consistent. I mean, were, were similar between monkeys. So no, I said yeah, it was. Sorry, I, I I looked at it. I forget whether what the, there was slight differences, but I it wasn't it spectacular was. that I remember. 